Oh. Is everybody here? Ra raise your hand if you're not here. Well, uh, I will uh, just say to you that our next speaker has uh, not only come from Sanford, California, but he came through North Carolina, and he's here. So we'll, we are happy about that. <laughs> uh, Professor James Campbell teaches African American history and the wider history of the Black Atlantic at Stanford uh, University. He has had a particular interest in the interconnections between Africa and America from the earliest days of the slave trade to our own time. His recent interest is what is called public history, is reflected in his topic today, Monumental Questions, Race, Memory, and Monument in America. He has a firm commitment to the humanities as an important element in higher education, and uh, we share that. And he weaves that image, uh, he weaves images into, <coughs> with that in, uh, image into his teaching. So please welcome him right now, and welcome him especially because he weathered a storm to come. <laughs> um, thanks so much for having me here. It's, a, it's delightful. Um, and it's, uh, an event like this restores apropos of our previous conversation, uh, some of my belief in basic principles of democratic self-government and citizenship, and those need all the reassurance they can get these days. Um, I've left this particular image on, and in some ways I think you've probably been looking at it already, and I think probably we could spend the next 45 minutes looking at it and you would get as much out of that as listening to me talk. Basically, everything I want to talk about is in this image. In fact, as I was preparing this talk, one of my colleagues, rather waggish, walked by, saw my computer screen, said, I didn't realize they were taking that one down. <laughs> Which, <laughs> but in a way, that's the point, isn't it, right? That uh, societies tell stories about their past. There's a politics to that story, to those stories, to what we remember, to what we choose to forget. And that those stories are unfolded in a variety of ways. They're unfolded in college classrooms and in textbooks, but also in Hollywood films. And most relevant to what I'm going to talk about today, monuments, which are efforts of one generation to carve quite literally in stone or bronze or whatever materials they use, some set of meanings, to inscribe some set of meanings that will instruct future generations. Yet the very claim of fixity that a monument has is quickly belied when you see a photo like this, which reminds us that these are choices, that these are constructions. Right? And also when you live through a period like we are living today, when precisely what monuments should be erected, which monuments might be taken down, how we in fact are going to represent our collective past as Americans on our public square when those questions are as fraught and debated as they are today. So already you can see, I mean, basically the themes here. This is, of course, the assembly of the great statue of Abraham Lincoln that sits at the Lincoln Memorial. And already, you know, just the, the specter of it being under construction. But you notice, for example, that many of the people constructing it are African American. That's not part of what we ordinarily think about. At one level, appropriate, given Lincoln's own history. And yet, those particular people would have been forced to sit in a separate section in the Jim Crow ceremony when this statue was dedicated to the 1920s. That basically is, a, is the set of questions and things that I want us to think about and talk about today. Let me start in a way that when I show this to my students, I always get a laugh. I have never yet in showing this picture to slide, why, why am I being so coy? Um, 
showing this picture to students for 15 years for different purposes. I've never yet had an American-born student who couldn't tell me what it represents. What does it represent? What? Right. I cannot tell a lie, said young George, when his father confronted him about the cherry tree. I did chop it with my little hatchet. This particular painting, and I could go down a well on this painting, and I'll try not to go too deep. Uh, just one of my very favorites. Anybody know the painter? It's Grant Wood. It's the same person who is most famous painting uh, is American Gothic. And here you see him. The painting is called Parson Weems' Fable. There you see him in the studio with the painting. And you get the same mordant sense of humor in both of these paintings, the way in which uh, would pokes fun somewhat lovingly uh, at some of the stories that Americans love to tell about themselves, how we imagine ourselves. This particular painting and is a riff on another very famous painting, which you probably have also seen as well. This is a self-portrait by Charles Wilson Peale, uh, who was one of the great portrait artists of the founding generation. If you've ever seen a portrait of the people we still call our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, John Adams, the now rediscovered and strangely beloved Alexander Hamilton, there's a, <laughs> he really, he was not that cool. Um, uh, there's a very good chance that Charles Wilson Peale was the painter. In fact, there were really two great, Gilbert Stewart and Charles Wilson Peale. Washington alone sat for Peale some seven times, out of which some 50 portraits were taken. In fact, if you look here, Grant Wood, it's, one of, it's a mock-up of one of Peale's portraits of Washington on the head of young George. And there, of course, where Peale had inserted himself, Wood inserts himself. This is also a pretty remarkable painting. Peel also liked to produce, I don't know, half dozen or more self-portraits. He clearly liked to paint himself almost as much as he liked to paint George Washington. This is a picture of him drawing back the curtain, showing the world, and I think predominantly trying to show a European world, the wonders of this new nation of America. This was called the American Museum. It's the first natural history museum in the United States. Talk about a sweet piece of real estate for your museum. It was on the second floor of Independence Hall. <laughs> just one floor up from where in the previous quarter century, both the Declaration of Independence and the American Constitution had been signed. You see in this painting an enormous amount about Peale's attempt to project to the world, to Americans themselves and to a watching world, the nature, the wonders of this new nation which he and others of the founding generation saw as a kind of unique marriage of nature and enlightenment. Thus, the fauna on display in the cases along the bottom, all arranged in Linnaean tax taxonomic categories, and along the top, a series of portraits of eminent Americans. Here in the foreground, you see his, his taxidermy student tools as he's preparing to stuff the bird that many people thought should have been our national bird, the turkey. And you also, boy, there's a story here. There's a mastodon skeleton in the back, behind the curtain, just being revealed. And in fact, a mastodon jawbone here. There hangs a tail there. If any of you have visited Monticello, Thomas Jefferson actually had a small little natural history museum that he created for himself in the foyer of Monticello which also included a mastodon jawbone. You can still see it. Why? Well, part of the answer is that that enlightened generation and preeminently gener uh, Jefferson uh, was engaged in a vociferous debate with European scientists, particularly with the great French encyclopedist, Count de Buffon, who argued that North America, because of the extremity of its climate, was not a good place for life of any sort to emerge. So that plant species were degraded, animal species were small and puny, Native Americans had small propagating organs, Buffon argued. Now for Jefferson, this was, 
<laughs> this was, you know, for Jefferson and that generation, North America was the exact opposite thing, right? It was the place where life, where nature and enlightenment could be born anew. So he was constantly arguing with these guys. He, in fact, had the governor of New Hampshire go out and send a hunter out to shoot a moose, stuffed it, sent to Paris, right? <laughs> Puny, see this? So when, sometime in the late 18th century, in what is now Kentucky, they discovered a tar pit and started to unearth these mastodon bones, Jefferson was in heaven, right? And so they're quickly assembling these things um, as proof. In fact, when Lewis and Clark went on their journey, Jefferson asked them to keep an eye out. Uh, for Mastodon and to bring one back <laughs> if they found one. In any event, an interesting painting. Now when I show that picture to my students, all of them know it's George Washington and the cherry tree. I've yet to find one who knows why they know that story. How do we know what we know about our history or imagine that we know? In this case, it's pretty easy. It comes from this particular book, actually not the first edition published in 1800, I think it's the fifth or sixth edition in about 1806. The life of George Washington with curious anecdotes, equally honorable to himself and exemplary to his young countrymen. This is a book written for young Americans by a man named Mason Locke Weems, a failed preacher and itinerant bookseller. In 1800, it's a pivotal moment when Weems produces this book. This infant republic is not only reeling from the death of its most revered founding father, George Washington, in 1799, but also from what appears to be the collapse of its republican institutions. When Americans say to me today that our politics today are more partisan than they have ever been in history, I kind of want to say read a book. Right? <laughs> We had a civil war in which 600,000 soldiers perished. But we also had the election of 1800. Notwithstanding Washington's celebrated admonition in his farewell address to his countrymen to avoid the frightful tyranny of political parties, the nation had in fact devolved into two competing parties. The Democratic Republicans under Washington's Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, Funny, Democratic Republic, my students all scratch their head when you say that. And the Federalists who coalesced around Washington's Vice President, John Adams, and Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. These parties hated each other. The Federalists argued that Thomas Jefferson was an atheistic Francophone determined to unleash the terror of the French Revolution at home. Jeffersonians gave as good as they got. They also, by the way, argued something that we now believe based on DNA evidence is true, that Jefferson had fathered children with one of his enslaved women that he owned, a woman named Sally Hemings. The Jeffersonians gave as good as they got. They argued that Adams and the Federalists were closet monarchists trying to steer the independent United States back into the thrall of Great Britain. They also argued that John Adams was a hermaphrodite. That's, I promise that's the last reference I will make to any genitalia in this talk. In any event, um, in this moment, this perilous moment, Parson Weems poured oil on turbulent waters by inviting his countrymen to reflect reverently on their greatest founding father. In fact, he invited them to a posture, a five-dollar word, a filial pietism. A posture that still, I fear, comes naturally to us in this country, most notably in our relationship to those people we still call founding fathers. A period of, a, a posture of worship of the ancestors, a posture that, as you will see from the rest of my talk, I think is actually unworthy of, of a democracy. In any event, uh, Weems um, included, I think, again, the fifth or sixth edition, the story of the cherry tree. Uh, how most Americans heard it, actually, was when it was included in one of these McGuffey readers, these cheap penny press texts through which millions of 19th century Americans learned to read. Thus did it become one of our most beloved stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves.
several morals in here in this little parable. One, nations tell stories about themselves to themselves. I suppose that all human collectives do. It's part of what makes us human. But this process may be particularly important in the life of nations, which notwithstanding the way in which they imagine themselves as ancient and primordial, are actually extremely recent inventions. A lot of people who live in what we think of France didn't speak French in 1789, and they certainly felt little loyalty to what was happening in Paris. America, the United States, is a late 18th century invention. Italy and Germany are late 19th century inventions. So this notion that we have as nations is somehow so fundamental of blood and soil of who we are that we will kill for them. That's an intellectual project. It's an ideological project. It's a project of forging a sense of collective memory and identity that happens, I would argue, through stories we tell about what we imagine to be our shared past. I mean, in Barack Obama's first inaugural address, he started talking about Valley Forge and how we had come through Valley Forge and would come through this as well. And, you know, it's so obvious to us why he would do that that we rarely stop to think, well, wait a minute. You know, your father was from Kenya. Your mother's family wasn't in the United States in 1776. And yet that's nations are forged from words. It may also, second thought, be the case that nations like the United States, with relatively shallow histories, ethnically diverse, with few shared traditions on which to draw, that in such nations, the telling of these stories is particularly important. Third point, this process of national storytelling involves not only process of rec processes of recollection, but also processes of revision of forgetting, of marginalization and exclusion. If there were any cherry trees on the complex of plantations around Mount Vernon, and there probably were, they were not tended by young George, to be sure, but by those tiny figures you see represented by wood in the back of the frame, enslaved Africans and African Americans, some 600 of whom worked in the complex of plantations that Washington controlled. Last point, it may be the case that this process of consolidating a shared filial pietistic narrative takes place particularly at that moment in which the generation that lived the experience is passing away. We don't have, and every time I've give a, any talk about this, I ask people if in any language they speak, they have words for this. I'm not aware that we have in English words that represent the distinction between historical events that still inhabit the living memories of living people and historical events from which we are now cut off. And yet somehow, I think, intuitively as humans, certainly in this country, that's a very important distinction, and a great deal of memory work is done, I think, at that moment of generational transformation. Well, when I tell the story of Parson Weems' fable to students, it's always good for a laugh. It all seems so quaint. Who could possibly believe this kind of stuff? I would argue we're not much better. I want to be careful here. This is, of course, Tom Brokaw who coined the term the greatest generation, a term meant to extol that generation steeled in the challenges of the Great Depression that then marched out into the world in the Second World War and redeemed it from fascism. This has always rankled me, right, this idea. Um, and not because I'd have some sort of dearth of respect for the people who live that. Thinking about this, in fact, I'm, I've been struck over and over by how profoundly my own sense of what it means to be an American has been shaped 
by my encounters with this generation. Most of those people now gone. I have an uncle who, in fact, is featured in one of Tom Brokaw's documentaries. I grew up literally within a block of a man who escaped the Bataan Death March, of another man who was a paratrooper on D-Day whose plane blew up his glider. Um, he was the only person off the plane who survived. Two other men who landed on Pacific Islands. I mean, I take a back seat to no one in my respect for these people, but I think we do them no honor when we call them a greatest generation and imagine themselves or imagine our relationship to them in a kind of filial pietistic Parson Weems, George Washington, the cherry tree kind of way. Case in point, some of you will remember in 1995, the Air and Space Museum of the Smithsonian Institution decided it was going to do a special exhibition on the Enola Gay, the airplane, the B-29, that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. They have the plane. Shortly before, on this, the 50th anniversary, the exhibition opened, some of the text panels were leaked to people in Congress. I think, I should be careful, I assume, maybe I'm wrong, to, chiefly to Republicans in Congress, who were outraged to discover that one of the text panels talked about the fact that at least 60,000 people were incinerated, almost all of them civilians, when that bomb detonated. Went on to note that aerial bombardment of cities at the start of the Second World War was unequivocally a war crime. Indeed, the same international treaty that has made the use of poison gas a war crime also made aerial bombardment of cities a war crime. One of those prohibitions has stuck, mostly. It's being challenged now. But the other didn't. And it was in the course of the Second World War when all of the combatants, not initially the United States by any means, began to use not just tactical bombing of cities, but what came to be called by the United States military strategic bombing as a war aim. And indeed, that was how the war finally was concluded. So enraged were the political classes of Washington at the inclusion of that fact, that set of facts, at that attempt in their estimation to besmirch the honor of this flawless greatest generation, that Congress threatened to cut off all funding of the Smithsonian Institution and the institution was forced to cancel the exhibition. In fact, if you go to see the Enola Gay now, it's not in the Air and Space Museum on the mall. It's over in the annex by Dulles Airport. And if you look at the interpretive panel, I'm not making this up, it's about this big. This is a B-29 called Enola Gay, had a crew of, I don't know, 13, four Pratt and Whitney engines capable of generating however many horsepower, and oh, by the way, it dropped the atomic bomb. That's what I mean where I think we do no honor to this generation, nor do we do honor to ourselves as democratic citizens. Now, of course, the culmination of this process of our, our recent version of George Washington, the cherry tree, was this erection of a national memorial to World War II on the mall in Washington, D.C. The people who pushed for this mall, people like Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg, were good liberals, but this, mall, this memorial rose up during a period of conservative insurgency, and in particular in the early years of the so-called War on Terror. And its character, I think, reflects that specific historical moment. I also think that this mall with its screaming Balanchine eagles, its marble cenotaphs, with words like Alaska, Alabama, Hawaii, and a few patriotic bromides.
No names of the dead except for stars representing each of them a thousand people. This memorial, which, forgive me for saying this, I sometimes think, particularly with the large bronze Balanchine eagles, looks a great deal like a World War II memorial might have looked had the other side won. That this memorial is also, in my opinion, as the whole greatest generation trope is, in my opinion, a response to another generation and to another memorial. It is, in my opinion, a rejoinder to Maya Lin's haunting Vietnam Memorial. In contrast to the World War II Memorial, Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial was not built 40 years later as the generation that weathered the crisis of Vietnam at home in Vietnam and at home was beginning to pass away, but rather designed in the immediate aftermath. I mean, the competition for the design, I think, started in 1979, just four years after the last American helicopter had lifted off of Saigon's U.S. Embassy, a period when the wounds of the war were still raw. No patriotic bromides here. No stars. No Balanchine eagles. Just a plain black marble sur surface embossed with the names of some of those who died in the war. And we do well to remember that. There are about 55,000 names on that wall. More than two million people died in the Vietnam, Vietnam War. 55,000 Americans. I'm sure if you have visited it, and I imagine you have, you've had the same experience that I've had probably many times, although alas, one has it less and less today where you see visitors come to it and find a name and have these moments of emotional catharsis as they see the name of a son, of a friend, of a husband, of a father, of a comrade. It became a kind of altar. People began to leave stuff. What would you leave there? But here, combat boots, an artificial leg. I've seen medals, letters, flowers. The National Park Service, in its wisdom, quickly realized that something remarkable was happening. And to this day, at the end of every day, a Park Service ranger goes and collects all the items that were left. They're cataloged and deposited in the National Archives, a kind of national memory box. Again, there are different ways of telling our story and the monuments we create are not self-evident statements, but statements that emerge out of various kinds of political choices. My own work right now focuses on what I think is the next iteration of this, the passing of the civil rights generation. I'm working on a book on this very thing. And again, you see the same impulse to filial pietism. And the same impulse to sand away those things that are awkward in order to tell stories that somehow vindicate the essential rectitude of American institutions. And if you're telling stories about African American people, that's going to take some ledger domain. People whose ancestors were enslaved for 246 years, who endured 100 years after that a formal discrimination, and who still live, as we're seeing in our politics today, in some ambiguous relationship to what many white Americans imagine as the United States. So you get a figure like Rosa Parks. Right? Here you see her lying in state in the Capitol Rotunda, an honor normally reserved for presidents, recently extended to the late John McCain. But to make the Rosa Parks that we know required sanding away awkward aspects of her history. I mean, I had a student some years ago. Somebody once told me that if you really want to know what stories a nation tells about itself, read children's books. So I had a student who took that to heart and went back to 
her high school, not her high school, her elementary school, into the library to see what books were there about civil rights. And what was amazing was 70 or 80 percent of them were biographies. Americans believe in individuals, don't we? Most of those were about one of two figures, Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks. And I remember he quoted the beginning of one of those books about Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was not a political activist, it wrote. She was a simple seamstress who one day at the end of work was tired and didn't want to give up her seat. Well, that's not true. Rosa Parks was a political activist. Rosa Parks was secretary of the Montgomery branch of the NAACP. She was a member of Montgomery's Women's Political Council. She had organized other black women in previous years to seek justice for a woman named Recky Taylor, a black woman in Montgomery who had been victimized in a gang rape by white assailants who had then not been convicted of the crime. Rosa Parks had attended leadership training schools at the Highlander Folk School, which a short time after the Montgomery bus boycott would be shut down because of its alleged communist ties. Rosa Parks not a political activist. The people in Montgomery, the women in Montgomery knew based on what they had seen of the law and what they had seen in previous bus boycotts in Shreveport, among other places, that the Montgomery system was vulnerable to legal challenge. And in fact, we're looking for a test case. They found one when a black woman named Claudette Colvin was forcibly ejected from a bus after refusing to give up her seat. And were about to pursue the case when they realized that she was pregnant out of wedlock. And they decided not to pursue it because they reckoned that the woman who became the focus of the test case would become an important symbol. Little, little, little could they have imagined just how important. We see the same thing in the kind of disnification of Martin Luther King. Children in the United States today can recite the words, some of the words, of the I Have a Dream speech. You see the photo of it here in 1963, standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, in which he called upon Americans to be the Americans they claim to be. I have a dream that one day this nation shall rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Now, don't get me wrong, that is one of the towering speeches in American history, and much of it, including that passage, was delivered extemporaneously. Can you imagine? And yet, what do students who know that story learn of the Martin Luther King who said, what good is it to be able to sit at a lunch counter if you don't have the money to buy a hamburger? whose last book was called, Where Do We Go From Here? Who not only risked, but lost virtually all of his political popularity among white liberals, among some black leaders, by coming out against the war in Vietnam. Who said that every bomb dropped in Southeast Asia explodes in an American city. Who marched for fair housing in Chicago who died in Memphis supporting striking garbage workers who walked beneath, behind sandwich boards that said simply, I am a man. What do we get of King when we flatten him or monumentalize him into this figure who essentially asks Americans to do nothing more than be who we really are? And of course now, at 1964 Independence Avenue, even the address they gave the King Memorial fixes him in the past. We have this Martin Luther King monument, not far from Thomas Jefferson. Now, I don't mean to just inflict my prejudices about monuments on you, but I hate this one too. <laughs> and, and, you know, part of it is, I mean, there's a real saga to it, right? It's, it represents another speech that he delivered in Birmingham, supposing to see him carving a tunnel of hope through a mountain of despair. The sculptor was actually a Chinese man whose primary commission prior to that had been a monumental sculpture of Mao. That's kind of interesting. 
The original design that was submitted to the Monuments Board, in, there's a Monuments Board that oversees all uh, uh, monuments on the mall, um, was rejected because they said it made King look too militant. Kind of interesting. But what I really don't like about it is its scale. They had to get a waiver to make it this big. You know what? There are over 100 figurative monuments in the District of Columbia, none of which, save this one, is taller than 21 and a half feet tall. Why? Because the bronze figure of freedom on the rotunda of the Capitol, a figure, for the record, forged by enslaved people, that bronze figure is 21 and a half feet tall, and nobody's taller than freedom. So if you see Thomas Jefferson in his rotunda standing there, he's just under 21 feet. If you see Abraham Lincoln seated there, he is 21 feet from his feet to the top of his head. It's cheating because he's sitting. He'd be about 32 feet if he stood. <laughs> they got a waiver to make Martin Luther King over 40 feet tall. Why? What does that do? Why would this movement of all, a movement in which tens, hundreds of thousands of ordinary Americans stood up to claim their portion of this country's promise, why would we reduce that movement into the story of this one massive mosaic figure? What does a monument like this tell us other than to wait for the next great Moses to come and lead us across the Red Sea? Much of recent attention has focused on monuments related to the Civil War. I tell my students this is not a photo of a Civil War battlefield. They didn't have color photography then. <laughs> it is, it, they do, we do have photographs. This is the second war in human history photographed. The first was the Crimean War. This is the second one. These are reenactors kind of worth thinking about this. What's going on in, that prompts thousands and thousands of people to don these coarse woolen uniforms in the heat of summer, uniforms that are correct down to the design of each button, and march about? If you were trying to find some chapter of American history to put a patriotic lump in Americans' throat, you probably wouldn't think this was where you'd start. A war in which some millions of Americans took up arms against their government in explicit defense of their right to own human property. And yet, that's what the Civil War has become for us. It has become this great unifying trial, this great crucible. Civil War battlefields are the closest thing that this country has to holy sites, and people approach them reverently. A number of historians, I need to move quickly, have written about how this process of re-remembering the Civil War happened. And again, it happened in that moment when that generation was passing away. David Blight, a historian at Yale, Race and Reunion, much of what he and other historians have talked about is the particular role of Confederate filial organizations. The sons of Confederate veterans, daughters of the Confederacy, who set out chiefly in the 1890s to combat what they called long-legged Yankee lies and to tell a properly Southern version of what came to be called the Lost Cause. Much of the work they did was in the spirit of erecting monuments. Two of my very favorite books. This is an art historian at the University of Pittsburgh, Kirk Savage, Standing Soldiers, Kneeling Slaves, about race war and monument, Civil War monuments particularly. And this book, Monument Wars, about the history of the mall in Washington. Now these monuments have become particularly visible to us today. This is Silent Sam on McCorkle Place, the University of North Carolina. Uh, and if I had a more recent picture, what you would see there would be a bare pedestal. This period is it's significant. I mean, let me go back to this first. 
if you look, I say this to my students, I tell them if, if they find me a Confederate war memorial that's not erected between 1819 and 1915, I owe them dinner. In other words, these are not erected in the 25 years after the war ends. Because during that period, this is the most bitter and divisive conflict in American history. They're erected in the 25 years that follow. As the Civil War generation is passing. And as the United States is going through an extraordinary process of sectional reconciliation. Of white reconciliation. In which Northerners and Northern Republicans in particular finally accede to the restoration of white supremacy in the American South. The years these memorials are being erected are also the years that see the formal disfranchisement of black people, that see the adumbration of legal Jim Crow, legal segregation, that see lynchings on the order of 200 to 250 per year. These processes of exclusion of black people and of exclusion of the facts of slavery as a cause of the war and the embrace of the Civil War as a great white unifying trial. Those processes are unfolding together. Popular culture plays a role. I don't have time to talk much about this, but this is probably the most influential film Hollywood ever produced in terms of its film technique. Uh, D.W. Griffith's famous Birth of a Nation, based on the book by Thomas Dixon, The Klansman and Historical Romance of the Ku Klux Klan. And here you see the, the climactic scene, or one of the climactic scenes, in which the heroes, the Klansmen, prepared to deliver lynch justice, summary justice, to the black rapist. This is the first film screened in the White House to Woodrow Wilson and his cabinet. Wilson gave it two thumbs up. History written lightning, he said, and it is all so terribly true. And well might he have because the intertitles for the book, or for the movie, actually came from his history. Wilson, remember, was a professor of history at Princeton. Till the white men, so adventurers swarmed out of the north. This is the account of Reconstruction as much the enemies of one race as of the other, to cozen, and beguile and use the Negroes. In the villages, the Negroes were the office holders, men who knew none of the uses of authority except its insolences, until at last rose this veritable empire of the South, this Ku Klux Klan, to redeem the South. And indeed, if you read your textbooks today, they're still called redeemers. The same story is told in a somewhat more benign version in Gone with the Wind. It's told in American history textbooks. Some of you had this textbook in school, I'd wager. The Growth of the American Republic. This is the best-selling US history textbook from its, when it's first published in the mid-1930s till the early 1960s. Until the 1963 edition, it had one paragraph about the experience of enslaved people. And I can almost quote it. As for Sambo, it began, whose travails moved the abolitionists to wrath and tears, there is good reason to believe that he was not the primary victim of the South's peculiar institution. The primary victim being these hard-pressed masters who had to bring civilization and extract labor from these prevaricating, indolent, childlike, exuberant, uncivilized enslaved workers. Paragraph ends. Say, so slavery could sometimes be harsh, but the Negro, with his unconquerable goodwill, made the best of his situation, and he sure loved his white folks. And he sure loved his white folks. Some of this persists. I have gray hair in that picture, so this is not that old a picture. <laughs> On this site, in fact, Louisiana was one of the last states redeemed and in this place called Colfax came the basis of an essentially important Supreme Court decision which gutted the 14th Amendment. A group of a militia loyal to the elected government of Louisiana was attacked and slaughtered. The church they were in was set on fire. Um, 
by uh, supporters of a rival white restored or redeemed government, thus ending carpetbag misrule in the South. <coughs> In recent years, and I'm over time, let me go fast. Some of this history is being challenged in the monumental sphere. Some of the most interesting battles have taken place in extraordinarily prominent places. That's Independence Hall in Philadelphia, still the most visited historic site in the United States. Right across from it is the Liberty Bell Interpretive Center. Well, in the 1990s, when excavating the foundations for the new Interpretive Center, People were surprised to discover the buried foundations of the first presidential mansion where George Washington lived. It was in Philadelphia. And we realized that the Liberty Bell sat on the buried foundations of the converted smokehouse that served as the mansion's slave quarters. Talk about return of the repressed. That provoked some controversy, particularly when the National Park Service announced that it was going to make no changes in the interpretation because they didn't want to confuse visitors with contradictory narratives. Well, that set the cat among the pigeons. Eventually there were negotiations and what they'd managed to do, I love this interpretive center, was turn the Liberty Bell not into an assertion but into a question. By tracing, among other things, the various efforts of different groups at different times, women seeking the vote abolitionists to lay claim to its meaning. It's worth visiting. This is the most recent thing they've put above ground showing the outlines of the old presidential mansion. Something similar happened in New York in the excavation of a new federal building just outside Wall Street when they began to unearth bodies of the old Negro burial ground. And instead of doing what they had done when that cemetery had previously been unearthed and ransacked, hauling the bodies away as refuse. In this moment of the 1990s and the early 20th century, there was a different conversation. And if you go there now, rather hard to find, you can see the African Burial Ground Memorial. Again, telling New Yorkers a different story of their past. Nearly a quarter of New Yorkers at the time of the American Revolution were enslaved in New York City. That's not a story we think of. Some of this, of course, has happened on college campuses, which were targets of the Confederate filial organization. So Silent Sam, in the early 20th century, erected at North Carolina. It's 1906-7. This is the Common Soldier Monument at the top of the Oval at the University of Mississippi. It's one of my favorite buildings. This is the old biology building at the University of Alabama, now houses the Honors College, named for Josiah Nat, Nott, a 19th century Alabama physician who did experiments on African American people and who was most celebrated for his, even at the time, quite extreme theory that black and white people were separate species. Here's a set of images from his textbook, Types of Mankind, where you see the European the Negro and the young chimpanzee becoming progressively more prognathous. It cracks me up that to represent the white race, he doesn't just pick a white person, he picks the Apollo Belvedere. <laughs> <laughs> this is me last month with my friend Leslie Harris at Knott Hall, still called Knott Hall. Yet some universities have begun to change in the shadow of the now vacated Silent Sam statue. In the early 2000s, this memorial was erected, called Forgotten Founders, a gift to the university of the class of 2002 to honor the forgotten founders, enslaved and free black people who had created, as they said in their deed of gift, the Carolina that we love today. A lot of controversy about this. It's very small. I think that's actually appropriate. It looks like a table. Some people would come and have lunch on it. Was that appropriate? Sometimes kids would climb on it. It's interesting to see what we think is appropriate conduct. Who gets to decide that? I tend to think 
I'm not going to tell you how to interact with this monument, but the surface is now covered with flowers so that people will have to comport themselves in the way that some at least think is appropriate. This is a memorial at Brown University. Full disclosure, I was chair of the committee that uh, investigated Brown's historical relationship to slavery when I was teaching there and one of its recommendations was the creation of a memorial to the transatlantic slave trade reflecting the fact that some 30 of Brown's board of trustees either owned or captained slave ships. Again, questions, this is Martin Purrier, the architect, about how you're supposed to comport yourself. It's become a joke among some in Rhode Island that people will go there for their marriage photos, right? The old ball and chain, get it? <laughs> you know what? I don't think it's for me to tell them. University of Virginia has just completed a five-year self-study on the university and slavery, identifying by name literally thousands of enslaved workers who worked on the campus. Among other things, unearthing a burial ground outside the wall of the university burial ground in which enslaved bodies were essentially dumped. A burial ground that had become overgrown with trees and weeds it is now, you can in fact still see, archaeologists have a word for these, I'm not sure, these columns where the bodies were. They were not unearthed, but the space was turned into a memorial site. And in fact, Virginia will soon dedicate a monument to enslaved workers on its campus. Some of them are now coming down. Mayor Landrieu of New Orleans spoke eloquently in a speech now just over a year and a half ago about the decision to remove Confederate memorials <coughs> from the city of New Orleans. This was the most prominent, Robert E. Lee being taken off his high pedestal in that circle. If you've been to New Orleans, going around the circle in the streetcar. Other places haven't removed them but have added a recontextualization. So this is a new panel at University of Mississippi which talks about how and when and why these memorials were created and also notes how this memorial became a rallying point for people violently resisting the integration of the university in 1962. This is back to Charlottesville, Virginia, the removal of a statue of Robert E. Lee, which as we know last year provoked a violent incursion into the city by neo-Nazis and other white supremacists groups which ended with one death. Immediately thereafter, Silent Sam became a target of protesters, some of them students at University of North Carolina, many of them not. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago now, Silent Sam was toppled from his pedestal by these protesters in defiance of a law that had been hastily passed by the North Carolina legislature, making it illegal to remove any statue on public lands without the explicit permission of the state. At this moment, what will come of this remains unclear. A dozen people have been arrested for their role in the toppling and the protests and counter-protests that followed. The figure of Sam actually is being held at a secret location while people debate his fate. If monuments are assertions, statements of one generation to another, Silent Sam's bare pedestal has become a question, a symbol of so much of our history that remains difficult, awkward, and unresolved. What better monuments could you have than that? Thank you very much. Thank you. So I've burned through too much time, but we do have some time for questions, and I'd love to hear your questions, thoughts, speeches, whatever you got. Lori. Jim, there is a new museum to lynching. 
not 25 years later, but a century later. Can you please comment on that and give your feelings about it? Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. It's in Montgomery. It's a monument or memorial, the lynching memorial. It was the work of an organization in Montgomery called the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, two things I'll say about it. One was, and I was on the far, far, far periphery of some of these conversations a decade or more ago. One of the ideas of the Equal Justice Initiative initially was to create a kind of American equivalent of the of the stumbling stones that they have in Berlin, sites related to the Holocaust, to create historical markers everywhere some of these 4,000 recorded lynchings occurred. And I've s a couple of those went up. I think many others haven't. I think there's some concern about what would happen to some of those in, in particular areas. What they have done instead is create what is by all accounts and by the pictures I've seen an extraordinarily powerful uh, memorial in Montgomery itself. That said, part of what is compelling to me about the Equal Justice Initiative, and I'm glad you asked the question because it lets me make a point I really didn't get a chance to. Monuments operate within what one might call a politics of recognition. Here are the stories that we seek to tell or that we remember, or here are the stories that you have forgotten that I demand that now be included. And for a variety of reasons, we could talk about what they are. The politics of recognition has become immensely uh, vociferous in the society that we're living at this moment. And it seems to me, on all sides, how dare you take down our monuments? How dare you have that monument, which is an affront to me? I want, you know, and, and it's so second nature to us. I mean, it's interesting, for example, uh, I think the Museum to African American History on the Mall, the New Smithsonian Museum, you should see it if you haven't, it's spectacular, it's dazzling. You could get a Republican controlled Congress to support the creation of that museum. You couldn't get that same Congress to support federal protections to ensure access to the vote. Right? Why? And so for me, the reason I bring this up is the politics of recognition for me is not or ought not be an end in itself. I think what we learn from the histories that I've been telling here is that by crafting what we remember and what we forget, you are also creating new political possibilities in the present. The remaking of Civil War memory is part of a white supremacist project. Right? So that the way we remember is significant, not simply for its own sake, but because changing it also alters the matrix of political possibility in the present. And I sometimes worry that we've become so obsessed with simply the recognition side that we, realize that what, that we forget that what we're really trying to do is tell a more inclusive story that tells us why the society we live in looks like it does so that we can act to improve it. And what I love about the Equal Justice Initiative is it's not just about the monument. They are also, as I'm sure you know, doing an extraordinary amount of work to ensure equal justice for all Americans, including disparities in sentencing, including people on death row, and so forth. So that, you know, is to me a kind of model that the purpose of remembering better more inclusively, more honestly, is because it helps us better identify the work we have yet to do. So I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I grew up in Oregon. Mm -hmm. My whole family's from Montana. So I grew up going to battlefields from wars that the U.S. Uh, had against the Native American Correct. populations. Um, and I think now living on the East Coast for 13 years. The Pacific Northwest, Montana, obviously you have um, South Dakota with you know, the uh, Crazy Horse Monument being built. It seems that we've done a better job out West, and I think that's easier because, well, those, the, the history isn't quite so fresh, and the problems um, are just 
had to be longer in the past, and there aren't enough of those people left to, um, to raise these issues. So something that I think, though, living in Pennsylvania now for a few years, there are almost no monuments to the Native populations from here. And so I wanted to know your thoughts about kind of the way that the maybe the Northwest and Vancouver, Canada, you see, the way that they've been able to set some of those monuments. I think some of those museums are really good. Is there, is there space? How do we create space for monuments and remembrances of Native populations in places like Pennsylvania and other places on the East Coast? You know, the, the short answer to that question is I don't know enough to give you a good answer. Um, you're certainly right that, you know, I mean, if, this may seem an inflammatory thing to say, but I offer it simply as a statement of fact. If you read the Genocide Convention enacted by the uh, UN General Assembly after the Second World War, and it's not, don't misunderstand me, it's not, uh, I don't think it was intended to be retrospective. But by the strict definition of genocide there, the United States has been the scene of two genocides, not how we imagine our history, right? Um, and I think that probably you're correct also that uh, though the, the, what I guess we would now call ethnic cleansing of Native Americans was so formative of everything in the society that we live in, it, has, it remains, generally speaking, less salient in our imagination than um, the histories related to African Americans. Partly, you know, one of the tropes uh, out of that 19th century exterminationist project was the kind of romancing of the vanishing Indian. So, you know, there's a kind of notion that the, they're no longer here. Of course they're here, right? So that's part of how I think that has happened. I think you're absolutely right that the erasure of that history in the East has been much more obvious than it has been in the West. And I don't know what we could argue about why that is. You know, that we associate Native peoples with the West in ways we don't with the East, though they are obviously all of these places. I am, I'm at a university, Stanford University in California, that has completely effaced this history. You know, we call Stanford the farm. It sits on Leland Stanford Jr.'s farm. Well, before it was Leland Stanford's farm, it was an Ohlone village. Are still a lonely people, you know. So there's a lot of work on that. But I, again, I, I think it'd be really interesting to try to do the work. I mean, one of the things you start with is simply, you know, I, I think often people are surprised and interested to discover that stuff happened here. And so, I, you know, just do good historical research that draws local people into the process. And I think sometimes then you let, you see where that takes us. Thank you. Dr. Campbell, were you here for the first presentation? I was. Uh, is there, in your sense, your historic sense, of economic justice and legal justice, a connection? I, I know Sandra didn't plan this, perhaps, to have continuity all through the four presentations. But between the first two, do you see connections? Yeah, I do. I do. You know, that, that part of what... Part of what, uh, I mean, I, I resonated a lot with the first talk, and I was glad I got to hear it. Um, I have a specific question I want to ask you about Walter Lippmann, but I'll save that. That's like inside baseball. Um, but I think part of the flattening that I'm talking about, say, for example, of the civil rights struggle, right, has been, you know, incorporating it into what you were describing in your lecture as a neoliberal project. So all that this is really about is supposed to be about removing market impediments that would stop black people from exercising their freedom. So things that say you can't shop here or buy a house there, right? And we did that. So our work is done. Let's put up the monuments and move on. And that, of course, gives us no way of ex explicating persistent patterns of disparity in income, in wealth, in educational outcomes, in incarceration, and so forth. In fact, the only explanatory framework we're left with is essentially a racist one. 
you know, so we got rid of all these impediments that would allow these people to pursue their freedoms, to maximize their utilities. Now, again, I'm using the, the words of the earlier lecture. Everybody's doing it. What could be wrong with that? You got winners, you got losers. And, you know, that it's an incredibly, I won't even call it naive, in my estimation, perverse reduction of why the society looks like it looks racially. So yeah, I think, I think they, in that sense, they dovetail very neatly, the two talks. I hope they do. I was struck by when we start off with Mill and then Locke and we get to the middle, middle of the 20th century, 1950s, with uh, Hayek and Friedman. And then in the last 20 years, somebody like Glenn Beck, I uh, think. The, the, the sense uh, I, I was experiencing is that we're moving away from impressive thinkers to impressive personalities, so that in the past 20 years there has been so much hype. And, and I consider this as I read uh, Ben Rhodes' new book. Ben Rhodes is the first Obama staffer to write a book, and it's the world as it is, and he came on with Barack Obama without an impressive resume, but he could write, and, and so increasingly he's asked to write more and more difficult speeches to the point where at the end Barack Obama wants him to be in whatever room it is where decisions are being made. Uh, so what, what uh, I'm getting from that uh, is this look at Barack Obama and hype. Now, I think this isn't necessarily in between the two presentations, except to say that Barack Obama didn't govern like FDR or Harry Truman. He didn't govern like John Kennedy or Lyndon B. Johnson. He governed most like General Dwight D. Eisenhower. And that is all lost. Yeah, by there's... The Sort of no drama, Obama. A couple of things really quickly about that. You know, somebody once said, you know, that, that America is a nation that imagines it was, has, was born perfect and has been improving ever since. <laughs> um, and so, you know, progressive narratives trouble me. You know, I think particularly now, the notion that, you know, that we have our system of Republican government, small r Republican government, as a birthright, it's not a birthright, you know, par, you know, democracies fail. That's sort of the one thing history tells us. They all fail. They all have failed heretofore. And, you know, and so we need to be, in my opinion, sober and do more kind of maintenance. And again, having these kind of filio pietistic things where all you need to do is you don't need to question or engage democratically. You just need to, you know, mind your elders and uh, worship your ancestors and put up a few monuments, I think is irresponsible. Um, there's a funny, you know, my own declensionist story, I didn't put it in, is about the mastodon in that Charles Wilson Peel painting. Most of the effects of, of Wilson's museum um, actually went into the second American museum, which was established by P.T. Barnum. <laughs> and, uh, you know, where it was exhibited next to the Fiji mermaid and the woman who was George Washington's alleged 152-year-old African-American enslaved nurse. Um, so I've often thought that you could kind of tell a declensionist narrative about American popular culture tracing the migration from the enlightenment of Charles Wilson Peel to P.T. Barnum. <laughs> but thank you. Time for maybe one more. of the stepping, the stepping stumbling stones in Berlin reminded me that um, the Germans that have done, what do you think of the job of the Germans have done in memorializing the events in their past? I was very struck by it. Yeah. And I was just wondering whether it was perhaps because they lost as opposed to whether they won the war. Well, I mean, I, look, I, you know, the South lost too. Right? That's one of the problems, right? It's really hard to memorialize when you're on the losing side. And, and so part of, in fact, the, the sectional reconciliation and the move of recasting Civil War uh, stories as being not about slavery or secession, but being about 
the shared valor of common soldiers, right? One of the kind of secondary agreements in that was that the South got extra points because they fought so heroically. Everybody knew the North was going to win. It had such much greater manpower and material resources, but the South, you know, really gave them a really, really good fight. That's sort of part of how that, you know, that process of memorializing something. So we still extol the soldiers and particularly the generals of the losing side more than we do of the winning side, which is a peculiarity. The German case, I think part of the answer, and this is, you know, Americans are funny about this, right? Americans, at least until recently, have been very reluctant to unearth the more unsettling and painful and awkward parts of our history. But we are in the front of the queue when it comes to demanding that other nations do theirs. You know, so American soldiers, when they liberated the death camps, actually took the local townspeople and made them walk through and see it and had an open Nuremberg trial, and in a variety of ways compelled a process in West Germany of this kind of confrontation, and a, a, of a, this confrontation with this painful past. And I don't mean to take, you know, somehow deflect all the credit away from Germany. I, I do have the sense that you do, that many Germans have done this process in a much more reflective way, have looked squarely at the ways in which some of their own chauvinism and nationalism, what it can do, and militarism. And are, I think, in my opinion, often much more responsible citizens in the world today as a consequence of that, that we who've never had that kind of chastening um, aren't. Last point is simply, that's a West German story. I mean, there's very different memories in West and East. And the kind of orthodoxy in East Germany is that this, the Holocaust, is not a manifestation of German nationalism, but it's a manifestation of capitalism. So we had naught to do with it, right? So there, the, the forgetting process did happen in a divided Germany as well. Thank you so, so much. I appreciate it. that you're making uh, many of us think of uh, monuments that we know and I think of two uh, recent ones that I think are successful and one you mentioned the the uh, the uh, Museum of African and African American history and culture I, I'm almost glad it didn't happen before I think that it uh, what went into it the the uh, the uh, thought and research that went into it make it a real um, important monument. And the other is a little bit different, and it, what I, uh, but I consider it a monument. It's Spike Lee's new, muse new, new uh, movie called uh, Black Klansman, so I recommend it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Jim, thank you so for a great talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank <laughs> you.